Hello everybody and welcome to this video where I'm going to do something I've never done before. We're going to watch Ocean Vong read some poetry and I'm going to decide if I think Ocean Vong is good. The reason this comes up is because Ocean Vong seems like the easy fucking target for everyone to fucking go after. I think Rupi Cower is number one, Amanda Gorman number two, and Ocean Vong number three. And I bet, I bet Ocean Vong was probably one or two about five years ago. And um, either people stopped fucking caring or there were bigger fish to fry or whatever but i never gave him much thought so that's what this is we're gonna give him some thought okay so what i did is i found a reading okay so this reading is from March 7th, 2017 at the Fashion Institute of Technology. This event is sponsored by Department of English and Communication Studies and the School of Liberal Arts. His accomplishments are just astronomical. Like when you read all the shit that he's done. So now we are going to fucking do this thing. So here we go. Um, just so you know too, I'm playing this off of the um, YouTube channel Archive On Demand or something. So um, just to be a bunch of sweeties here, um, go give them a sub. And we're not going to play this whole thing. I'm just going to play a few things in here. So let's see. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Patrick and Amy, for that eloquent introduction. And thank you, the students of FIT, for being here. Um, it's such a pleasure to, to, to read at the Fashion Institute um, because I believe that, uh, like fashion, poetry is the attempt to express oneself through problem solving. And I think when I think of clothing, I also think of it as an articulation of the self, the self and the mind fleshed inside out. And in the way the poem uh, operates and language itself operates. And so that the fabric is also speaking in a way. It's speaking in conjunction with the body. And it, it's a very liberating feeling to create that. And so I, I, I feel in many sense um, among kin uh, when I'm with you here. So thank you. Okay, here is the deal. I'm sure a lot of people don't like Ocean Vong because of things like that. Okay? Now, I'm going to fucking blow your mind right now. That was brilliant. Brilliant. What is the job of a poet? Answer the fucking question. I, I've been asking this question a lot to um, people... Not in the know, but like just like people who have some sort of authority on the subject, just to see how different all these answers are going to be. So here we go. What is the job of a poet? Okay, I'll tell you. To use words to convey emotion that people can resonate with, that people understand, that people feel connected to. Okay, that that that's basically it. Like break people's hearts with your words. The only way you could break somebody's heart is if your work connects with them. Okay, knowing this, Ocean Vong goes to the fucking Fashion Institute and explains what poetry and fashion have in common. He even says he he metaphors. The whole fucking thing. He says something like, to me, fashion is like poetry in that da 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 So he used poetry as a metaphor for the thing that all of these people are in school for. 
Like, I'm not sitting here talking about sales or anything like that, but that was fucking brilliant. That was fucking brilliant. And then you know what he says at the end? He feels a kinship with fashion designers because they do the same thing. They're cut from the same cloth. You feel me? You feel me? Um, Now, that would have been a cliche, and um, there's probably no way in hell he would have said that. But understanding your audience and understanding how to connect with your audience is the number one fucking thing a poet should do. And no poets do that. It is so fucking rare that a poet does that. The only time I've ever seen a poet do that is when they are among people who are exactly like them. And then they can say, without lying and without thinking too hard, we are all one here. All of us who are exactly the same. So whatever. Dude scored huge points with me just off of that. So congrats on that. That was that was fucking brilliant. <sighs> Uh, I'll read a little bit from the book, and then we'll have a conversation. This first poem... Another thing I want to say real quick is this I like. He says, I'm going to read from the poem, and then we'll have a conversation. Most poets go up, preface the fucking shit out of everything they're going to fucking read. So by the time you're done listening to this whole thing... You remember the speech before, and you barely remember the poem, if at all. And again, I've said this before. If the words you say in your preface are better than the words you say in your poem, your poem ain't working. Okay? It's a sort of ars poetica for me. An ars poetica, of course, is a poem articulating one's sort of raison d'etre for being a poet. Threshold. In the body where everything has a price. I was a beggar. On my knees, I watched through the keyhole. Not the man showering, but the rain falling through him. Guitar strings snapping over his globed shoulders. He was singing, which is why I remember it. His voice, it filled me to the core like a skeleton. Even my name knelt down inside me, asking to be spared. He was singing. It is all I remember. For in the body where everything has a price, I was alive. I didn't know there was a better reason. That one morning my father would stop. A dark cult paused in downpour and listen for my clutched breath behind the door. I didn't know the cost of entering a song was to lose your way back. So I entered. So I lost. I lost it all with my eyes wide open. Uh, this next poem attempts to reimagine the fall of Saigon where I was born and he does not over preface that first poem okay that poem was really really good but for me personally my taste it's a little long Um, I like my poems a little quicker to the cut 
not saying that's a bad poem. I think some people might have an issue with his reading voice, but his reading voice is not very different from his speaking voice. So I don't mind it at all. So like, and then if you just don't like his like speaking voice, then it's just like, that's kind of fucking weird. Like whatever. To me, I love a poem read by a poet when the poet feels like they are speaking to me and not putting on a performance. That's just like a personal thing for me. An interesting happened during that moment. Um, as uh, Saigon was falling to the north during this chaotic and terrible time, the American radio station played Irving Berlin's White Christmas as this coded signal um, for American personnel to evacuate. And I thought it was such a, a revealing but charged moment where even the fleeing was a code where those who could not have access to that language, to that code, are left behind. And in a way, uh, I, I see that as how language starts to exclude us um, or can be used to divide us, to, to make walls. Um, and so I wove the song through this rewriting of the fall of Saigon. O bard with burning city. Milk flower petals in the street like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. He fills a teacup with champagne, brings it to her lips. Open, he says. She opens. Outside, a soldier spits out his cigarette as footsteps fill the square like stones fallen from the sky. May all your Christmases be white as the traffic guard unstraps his holster. His fingers running the hem of her white dress a single candle, their shadows, two wicks. A military truck speeds through the intersection, children streaking inside a bicycle hurled through a store window. When the dust rises, a black dog lies panting in the road, its hind legs crushed into the shine of a white Christmas. On the bedstand, a sprig of magnolia expands like a secret heard for the first time. The treetops glisten and children listen. The chief of police face down in a pool of Coca-Cola, a palm-sized photo of his father soaking beside his left ear. The song moving through the city like a widow, a white, a white. I'm dreaming of a curtain of snow falling from her shoulders. Snow scraping against the window. Snow shredded with gunfire. Red sky. Snow on the tanks rolling over the city walls. A helicopter lifting the living just out of reach. The city so white it is ready for ink. The radio saying run, run, run. Milk flower petals on a black dog like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright. 
She is saying something neither of them can hear. The hotel rocks beneath them. The bed, a field of ice. Don't worry, he says, as the first shell flashes their faces. My brothers have won the war, and tomorrow the lights go out. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming to hear sleigh bells in the snow. In the square below, a nun on fire runs silently toward her god. Open, he says. She opens. Uh, a lot of this book also attempts to navigate what it means to be a queer body living and therefore surviving America and how perhaps some of us including some of my dear what he did in that poem was brilliant and it is a good poem and he had to give a little explanation beforehand to let you know why white christmas plays over the fall of saigon and then reads the poem some might say this is information we should know before reading the poem i don't know if that's true but in the reading of the poem that information was given okay think about this i don't know how many of you go to poetry readings or been to poetry readings or watch poetry readings but the best poets when they do the the talking the blah 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 between the poems it is short it is concise it says exactly what it needs to say and then poem so many times i have seen people do poetry readings where they talk and 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 then they start actually repeating themselves for some fucking reason like they'll say the same thing they already said like three more times before they get to the fucking poem this reading by ocean vong so far is like perfect like he is like he's a fucking pro dude call it for what it is here okay so let's get back to this now your friends don't make it because it's summer because it's summer you ride your bike to the park bruised with 9 p.m. The maples draped with plastic bags, shredded from days, the cornfield freshly raised, and you've lied about where you're going. You're supposed to be out with a woman you can't find a name for, but he's waiting in the baseball field behind the dugout, flecked with new ports, torn condoms. He's waiting with sticky palms and mint on his breath, a cheap haircut and his sister's Levi's stench of piss rising from wet grass. It's June after all, and you're young until September. He looks different from his picture. But it doesn't matter because you kissed your mother on the cheek before coming this far. Because the fly's dark slit is enough to speak through. The zipper, a thin scream where you plant your mouth to hear the sound of birds hitting water, snap of elastic waistbands, four hands quickening into dozens, a swarm of want you wear like a bridal veil, but you don't deserve it. The boy and his loneliness, the boy who finds you beautiful only because you're not a mirror, 
because you don't have enough faces to abandon. You've come this far to be no one, and it's June until morning. You're young until a pop song plays in a dead kid's room, water spilling in from every corner of summer, and you want to tell him it's okay. That the night is also a grave we climb out of. But he's already fixing his collar. The cornfield, a cruelty, steaming with manure. You smear your neck with lipstick. You dress with shaky hands. You say, thank you, thank you, thank you, because you haven't learned the purpose of forgive me. Because that's what you say when a stranger steps out of summer and offers you another hour to live. Um. All right. That poem was fucking amazing. That poem right there should shut the fucking mouths of every person who talks shit on fucking Ocean Vong. Seriously. Like, that was fucking amazing. It took you on every fucking journey you could possibly go on. It talked about... There was... Okay, so there was some eroticism. There was, like, time and place. There was um, senses. Like, seeing, tasting, smelling, feeling. Like... You had everything in there. And then you also had the uncertainty of this meet, of this meetup. You also have the, at the end of the poem, the, it's hard to be gay. And a lot of times it's very lonely. And a lot of times, like a lot of people take that one way out. And even though all this stuff has happened, he thinks the person for keeping him alive for just, like, another day. You know what I'm saying? That poem had everything in it. I feel, at least for me, and this might not be everyone's thing, but this is my thing. I feel like the end of that poem, because I love the ending of that poem, I feel like it could have come sooner. I feel like a bit of his stuff is a little long-winded but that's not bad that's just a personal preference for me because a lot of people i know love a long poem that they could really like dig into and like just be in for a long time so that's a personal thing on april 27th 2011 a gay couple michael humphrey and clayton capshaw was murdered by immolation in their home in Dallas, Texas. And they were burned alive um, in their house. And this poem is in the voice of one of the men speaking to his partner during this moment. It's written entirely um, in footnotes on the bottom of the page. The title borrows a moment in Dante's Inferno, particularly the seventh circle of hell, where the sodomites were punished by a rain of fire. Seventh circle of earth. As if my finger tracing your collarbone behind closed doors was enough to erase myself, to forget we built this house knowing it won't last. How does anyone stop regret without cutting off his hands? Another torch streams through the kitchen window, another errant dove. And it's funny. I always knew I'd be warmest beside my man. 
but don't laugh. Understand me when I say I burn best when crowned with your scent. That earth sweat and old spice I seek out each night the days refuse me. Our faces blackening now in the photographs along the wall. Don't laugh. Just tell me the story again of the sparrows who flew from falling Rome. Their blazed wings, how ruin nested inside each thimbled throat and made it sing until the notes threaded to this smoke rising from your nostrils. Speak until your voice is nothing but the crackle of charred bones. But don't laugh when these walls collapse and only sparks, not sparrows, fly out. When they come <coughs> to sift through these cinders and pluck my tongue, this fisted rose charcoaled and choked from your gone mouth, each black petal blasted with what's left of our laughter, laughter ashed to air, to honey, to baby, darling, look, look how happy we are to be no one and still American. Okay. Um, like that poem is tragic and touching the whole thing. Um, I too have, I mean, I don't know if they were friends of his or anything like that. It didn't sound like they were, but I know someone who had that exact thing happen to them. And that's tragic. And I understand poetic license and the whole fucking thing. But it's hard for me to think that he, mine, would have that many beautiful things to say when that was happening. So I appreciate the poem that he wrote. It's a gorgeous poem. But my friend, I don't think, would have felt that way when that happened to him. But a couple things here. Like, one, he needed to explain all of that stuff in order for you to understand the poem. And just like with the White Christmas poem, when I feel like there comes a line where... If you have to explain every poem you write, you're leaving too much out. And that's tricky for Ocean Vong, I think, because Ocean Vong already, to me, overwrites his poems. His poems are beautiful. His poems are touching. If on both the White Christmas poem and this poem, I don't know if not knowing that background would have made those poems less beautiful. Okay. I think the emotional connection wouldn't be there, but it doesn't mean the poem isn't beautiful, but knowing how important emotional connection is to at least ocean Vong for doing the whole thing he did with the students from the fashion Institute, you would think, that he would want to make sure that everyone knew the things that he was talking about. But again, Ocean Vong is famous as fuck, and Ocean Vong gets to fucking speak and give readings and all this shit. So when you become a certain level of famous and you know you're going to do 30 to 100 readings of your poems in public that are going to be recorded and broadcast i think you turn this thing into where like you're like well you know 
I could be a little vague here because I'm sure I'm going to fucking explain all this shit when I go out. But again, he doesn't overdo that. He said on this date, this couple, this happened. And then talked about Dante and then read the poem. The thing I don't love is the fact that he wrote that whole poem in footnotes at the bottom of the page, at the bottom of blank pages. That's very gimmicky to me. And there is reason why he did it, whatever, it's gimmicky. And I think when people will talk about that poem, they're either going to talk about, oh, that poem where it's written from the point of view of one of the guys in the couple that get burned to death on their bed or that poem that's written in footnotes. I don't know. Like it just seems like, so now like, can he ever write another poem in footnotes or is that like going to the well too many times? If doing something one time and you can't do that again afterwards, that's a gimmick. So if your book is full of gimmicks, that's going to be what the problem is. And I have ran into this with another um, more recent poet who I heard read some of their poems and thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to love this book. I get the book and the book is just gimmick after gimmick after gimmick after gimmick. But when you hear someone read, you don't hear the gimmick. Because the most important thing are the words. So just a a bit of advice. Don't over gimmick your book. Gimmicking your book up is going to make a publisher go, ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, we we, we can do, we could probably do something like that. That's kind of cool, you know. But at the same time, you just gimmick the fuck out of your book. The publishers don't care if you have a successful career. They care if this book's going to sell. That's it. So you got to think about yourself there a little bit, too. After all of this, is Ocean Vong good? Yes, Ocean Vong is fucking amazing on those poems. So all the people who've talked shit on Ocean Vong, explain to me why Ocean Vong is not good, because a lot of people pile up on Ocean Vong, Okay. Let me know in the comments why you think Ocean Vong's not good or why you think Ocean Vong is good. I'm telling you now that Ocean Vong is good. So go read Ocean Vong. Okay. With that said, everybody, type hard. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. Thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew of the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.